Hello and good evening. I'm Melissa Idris and you're watching The Future is Female, the show where we find the extraordinary in every woman. Asians make up almost half of the world's cancer cases, but we are in less than 10% of cancer research. Tonight on the show, we're going to be discussing why it's important to ensure that Asian populations are included in medical research, including the first large study on an Asian population of a genetic tool that predicts future risk of breast cancer. Joining me on the show tonight, I have Professor Datin Paduka, Dr. Tio Su Huang. She's the Chief Scien uh, Scientific Officer at Cancer Research Malaysia and also Dr. Ho Wenki. She is an associate professor with the School of Mathematical Sciences at the University of Nottingham, Malaysia. Welcome to the show. It's good to have you both here. Likewise. Okay, all right. So let's, let's first understand Cancer Research Malaysia. Um, and I wanted to know a little bit more about the work that it does because as I understand it, this is the, um, the first, the kind of non-profit organization that focuses on cancer research whereas all the other cancer society or cancer organizations are more kind of patient focused, right? Absolutely. Maybe you can tell us a bit more. Yeah. So there's a, a, as you know, Melissa, there's an increasing burden of cancer and every one of us has someone in our family or someone close to us yeah. who is already affected by cancer. And unfortunately, cancer incidence is increasing. So there are many cancer NGOs that are out there that are trying to provide services to help individuals cope with cancer and mm. so on. But I think that's while that's really um, important and fixes problems as uh, they arise, they don't really necessarily help to find a solution for how we might be able to cure more cancers. Okay. How might we be able to ensure that the advances in medical research which are going on in the West also apply to the cancers as they occur here in Asia. Okay. So unfortunately, the majority of research, as you already pointed out, is in the European population. So how are we going to do this in the Asian population? Mm. So close to 20 years ago, Tan Sri Tunku Ahmad Yahya and Topan Dr. Aisha On um, uh, worked with me to set up this organisation. And we had this audacious goal <laughs> that we're going to put Malaysia on the world map by doing research in Asians and ma making sure that Asians are not left out in the fight against cancer. Oh, wow. So in this past 20 years, we've done a number of different things. We have a cancer vaccine that is now um, gone through animal studies and looks really positive. We've recently uh, worked with a number, uh, a biotech company in the UK to try and take it to clinic and hopefully it'll go into phase one clinical trials or first human trials by early part of Can next year. Cancer vaccine for breast cancer? No, this is oh. a cancer vaccine for head and neck cancers, for oral cancer and nasopharyngeal cancer. And I would love to come back and tell you more about that cancer vaccine yeah. together with the team that's been developing it to really t showcase what, uh, what is our efforts in Asian cancers and why that's absolutely necessary. Mm. But the second part of our research has to be in trying to figure around how does the Asian population, how do the genetics of the Asian population, how do our lifestyle factors, how do the microbiomes that live in our gut because of the food that we eat and the environment that we're exposed to, how do all of these differences in the Asian population influence not just our risk to disease but also our response to treatment. And today what we're going to be talking about is a very large study that we've been working on that is on breast cancer genetics that epitomizes some of the work that we're trying to do in making sure that Asians are not left out in the fight against cancer. And then the third part of our work uh, within Cancer Research Malaysia has been to try and figure out with a lot of the unique problems that we have in our population, how do we bridge the gap in survival for cancer? Why is it that in some hospitals survival for cancer is very good and comparable to the best centers in the world, but in other hospitals the survival from cancer is much worse and there are disparities that exist. Mm. So in our patient navigation program, we're working in close collaboration not just with the Ministry of Health, but also with other NGOs to try and reduce the disparities in care and make sure that the best available treatments can be offered um, to all people, regardless of whether they are rich or poor, regardless of whether they live in a rural environment or a more urban environment. So to sum up, Cancer Research Malaysia is a non-profit organisation. We exist primarily to try and make sure that Asians are not left out in the fight against cancer. And we do that by soliciting uh, donations, not just from non-profit um, other foundations like Yayasan Saimdabi and Yayasan Petronas, but also by corporate partners, people like the Estee Lauder Group of Companies and Scientex Foundation and so on, but also by research grants and we're funded by the Wellcome Trust and the Medical Research Council okay. and so on. And these are all international awards as well as local awards mm. from the Ministry of Science. And last but not least, by members of the public, how do we fund all of the work that we do ensuring that Asians 
get included and the best advances in medical research can be brought to bear to improve survival for cancer right. in our own backyard. I mean, so many interesting things that you brought up. We're going to flash out during the conversation uh, over the next half now. I do want to ask, though, uh, how, Dr. Ho, how you have come to uh, collaborate with Cancer Research Malaysia. You're from Un University of Nottingham, Malaysia. I understand you're previously with the University of Cambridge. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you guys work together. Sure, sure. So Cancer Research Malaysia is actually one of the reasons that tempt me to move back to Malaysia. <laughs> so I was like answering a call to return home. One of the summer holiday, I you know went to visit Can uh, University of Nottingham, fell in love with the campus. I think in the same summer where I visited Cancer Research Malaysia, I got to know Sue through um, one of the colleagues in the University of Cambridge. I mean, after talking to them and knowing what they are working in Cancer Research Malaysia, you know, give me the um, confidence that you know coming home, being right. able to contribute to the country, is actually something that I really want to do. Okay. So in terms of our collaboration, is mainly in the breast cancer research study that we're going to talk about today. Um, in terms of a uh, contribution from myself and the University of Nottingham, is really just to, um, like what Sue said, there are there are so many different contributing factors to the disease. Right. How do you put all of this together? Well, you're the first author of the study, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, so, yes. How, so how how did you come to decide to work on this this study? Oh, this project is mainly uh, the main idea still come from Sue, of okay. course. Yeah, the main idea still come from Sue. Um, the team at Cancer Research Malaysia have spent a lot of time on establishing establishing the study. And then where, where I come in is really to contribute my knowledge in the stats. You know, how do you combine all these um, genetic markers that spread across the genome into one mathematical equation that can give you a score? Right. So that's how we okay. collaborate with each other. Okay, so I think we need to rewind a little bit <laughs> and talk a little bit about the polygenic risk score first. So this, uh, maybe you can explain to me what the PRS is and then um, how this study is actually an achievement in... Um, in including the Asian population in, uh, in cancer research. Maybe you can do that, uh, sure. uh, Prof. Bertio? I mean, this is a, as Yuki mentioned, this is a really long-standing collaboration. So we started the project in 2003, together with Professor Yip and Professor Aisha, both in University of Malaya. And over time, we set up a breast cancer cohort, so a cohort of women to try and understand what was their risk of breast cancer. And over the years, we've now built that cohort so that it's the largest cohort of women in Southeast Asia from two countries, oh from wow. Malaysia and Singapore. And there are 16,000 women in the study. So two hospitals in Malaysia, uh, University of Malaya and Subang Jaya Medical Center, and seven hospitals in Singapore. And together, what we're able to do is build this cohort of 16,000 women to help us understand what is it, why is it that some women are more likely to develop breast cancer than others. Mm. So, you know, in the past, um, of course, this space would have been made famous by individuals like Angelina Jolie, right? In Angel in Angelina Jolie yeah. in the 2013. Yeah. For that, yes. She came out and talked about how she how inherited a, a genetic alteration in the gene BRCA1, and that um, encouraged her to remove and undergo a prophylactic mastectomy so that she doesn't develop breast cancer and she wants it to be there for her children right. and so that her, she doesn't go through the suffers that her mother did from ovarian cancer and her aunt did from breast cancer. But this type of gene BRCA1 and 2 only accounts for about 5% of breast cancer patients in Malaysia. So what about the 95%? How do we predict which individual, which one in 19 Malaysian women are going to develop breast cancer. The reality is we know that we cannot just rely on the type of genetic test that Angelina Jolie had, which is the very high risk genes. We needed to find other ways in which other forms of genetic tests that can help us tell which individuals have potentially a 30% chance of developing breast cancer versus a 5% chance of developing breast cancer, maybe just a 0.5% chance of developing breast right. cancer. So the challenge is at the moment, we're al almost acting blind. Instead of being able to tell people what their actual risk is, we just tell them, oh, at 50, you are at risk of developing breast cancer. So we temba everybody and say, all of you should go for breast cancer screening okay. and all of you should go for mammography. Welcome back to The Future's Female. I'm speaking to Professor Teo from Cancer Research Malaysia and Dr. Ho. She's the first author of this um, large study on an Asian population, the first one on an Asian population of a genetic tool that predicts the future risk of breast cancer. We were talking about the polygenic risk score and I want to learn a little bit more about 
why, uh, so, so having a number um, tell you how much risk you have, uh, you predisposed to uh, developing breast cancer, why is that important? I, I kind of want to understand a little bit more about why it's important for us to know what level of risk we face. Um, who would like to take that question? Would you like to? I don't want to worst can. Okay, I, yep. yeah. go, go ahead. So I, yes, maybe yep. I can kind of um, put it in this way, right? If you know that you have a 100% chance of being fat, you might not want to do anything about it because it's a 100% chance. But if you let's say know that you have a 50% inherited risk of being fat, you might think, well, I might work on the remaining 50% mm -hmm. and I might be able to do something about it. So similarly, if every woman thinks that they only have a 5% chance of developing breast cancer, the majority of women might think it's not likely to be me. I'm going to be the 95% that doesn't develop breast cancer. Mm. But if on the other hand, you are like Angelina Jolie and you know that you have a 65 to 87% uh, chance of developing breast cancer, you might take a very severe move like a prophylactic mastectomy. So what we want to know is make sure that if we're able to give women accurate estimate of their risk, we might be able to identify the individuals who benefit truly from mammography screening and by encouraging those individuals to go for mammography screening, we might have a cost-effective way of making sure that we can detect cancers at an earlier stage. Mm. So this is where the study is really important because if you think about it, the Asian population makes up nearly 4 million people in the world. Nearly 4 million people in the world are Asians. But how many of those have got access to screening? If you just limit it to the 650 million people in Southeast Asia, there's 650 sou million Southeast Asians. Right. Only the 5 million people in Singapore currently have access to screening. So the reality is for the rest of the world, we don't have access to screening in, uh, because there isn't sufficient money. Okay. So if we know who is at risk, perhaps we might be able to identify the individuals for whom we can affordably give screening and hopefully detect cancers at an early stage. Right. And this is where the complex stats has really come in because yeah. previously it wasn't possible to do that. And that's where the polygenic risk score comes yeah. in. And one thing that I want to say, I like the example about the fat. I mean, there must be a reason why someone can grow vertically <laughs> and someone <laughs> never, like my friends, no matter what they eat. But anyway, so being able to tell women about their risk, one thing that Sue has mentioned is um, you know, you can reallocate the resources to specific, you know, target those who are at higher risk of developing the disease. But at the same time, also to make women more aware of their breasts, you know, to be more breast aware and aware of the changes of their breasts in between screening. Mm. Because it is possible that, you know, screening doesn't detect it and it happened in between screening. Knowing that, um, you know, yourself is at a much higher risk does, does make you more aware of this. So in terms of the polygenic risk score, um, like the chose, like case of the Angelina Jolie case, so those are very rare. That genetic notation is very, very rare. What we are talking about here is um, about 300 of these alphabets, you know, out of 3 billion of these alphabets that form, you know, make up our D DNA, DNA code, mm -hmm. yeah. About 300 of them have been shown to, you know, increase the risk of breast cancer. But these are all very tiny genetic variations that we inherited from our parents. You know, I have it, you may have it, she may have it. But having one or two of it probably wouldn't be a problem. But if you have a combination of it, it can, it can cause a problem. So that's where the stats and the maths come in. As I said, instead of calculating, do you have two out of 200, I have three out of 300, you know, um, what we're trying to do is to bring all these 300 into one equation and then generate it into a score. And instead of telling you how many do you have, I tell you what is your score. And then based on this score, we can group you into or group an, an, a woman into a different risk group. In fact, in our study, we showed that those women who are in the highest risk group actually had up to 16% chance of developing breast cancer in their lifetime. That's about one in six mm. compared to the general population where it was only 5%. Okay, so how do you get the score? Do you have to go for a test? Do you have to yes. get your DNA kind of sequenced? Or what, what, is, the, yeah. what is the So instead of sequencing, yeah, you know, there, there are different sorts of genetic tests. Um, the alphabets in the genome is about 3 billion. So yes. that's 3 with 9 zeros behind. <laughs> you know, a number with 9 zeros behind is now very familiar with most Malaysians <laughs> for a wrong reason. We can understand but that. We can that understand 2.6 yes. billion, 3 billion, about that same number, right? So there are different sorts of genetic tests that you can do. And this one is where we only test the 300 alphabets out of that 3 billion. Oh. And from that genetic test, just testing the 300, you can tell a woman what her individual risk of breast cancer is. 
This is important because the polygenic risk is equally important for individuals who have a family history of cancer as it is for individuals that do not have a family history of breast cancer. Mm. And this is very different from the previous genetic test that was done, like the Angelina Jolie type, where you would only consider a BRCA test if you have a particular type of breast cancer or if you have multiple family members that also have breast cancer. This one is really one that we think will apply to the general population because it's a random event within the general population. And it could be the case that my mother has one constellation of that 300, my father has a different one, and what I inherited just randomly okay. is a combination that could not be predicted just from, from my mother's or my father's test alone. Okay, so, so previous research had been focused a lot, it was a lot more Western-centric. Yeah. And now you're bringing it to include the Asian population. Yeah. Um, are Asian genes different from, you know, from Caucasian genes? Is that why you need to include it in, in, the, in the medical research? You look at an Asian person and you know they're Asian, right? <laughs> so the reality is we are genetically different, okay. right? Not just from the colour of our hair, from our height, from the shape of our noses, shape of our eyes and so on. There are genetic differences between populations. The mm. key is what proportion of those genetic changes actually make a difference into either a risk to disease or response to treatment. And the harsh reality is that because the majority of research is conducted in Europe and in North America and to a smaller extent in Australia, this is all among women of European descent. They eventually all came back from one part of Europe anyway. Mm. So the reality is we know very little about what happens in the Asian population. So this study is really important because not only were we able to bring investigators from Malaysia and Singapore together, we actually were able to bring investigators um, that was up to 45,000 women and it was a whole string of countries from China, Japan, Korea and so on and so forth in order to be able to make a representation of Asians in this type of analysis. So 45,000 is a huge sample yeah. size, right? Was yeah. that a, a, does that present as a challenge to you? <laughs> Um, playing with small sample size is a challenge. Oh, I, I see. Mean, so as the data, bigger the better. Yeah, okay. as a data scientist, the bigger the better. Mm. That's also why it's so important to collaborate. I mean, in, in Malaysia and Singapore, we have 16,000 women. That's a lot, a lot. But if you can extend the collaboration to other countries, is that's how we increase from 16,000 to 45,000 and in the future we're going to bring this up to 60,000 women oh, wow. trying to come up with something that's more um, even more Asian specific. Did you find that it was easy to collaborate that, that people were just so willing and eager to join into this space because finally there was an avenue to include Asian populations? If only. So uh, unfortunately oh no. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Doesn't yeah. Yeah. So in, in science as in many aspects of human life there's always a lot of politics so we were very fortunate to be able to collaborate with uh, Professor Doug Easton and Professor Antonis Antonio, uh, in who together with me are the senior authors for this study with, with Yuki. And what this, uh, this um, Antonis as well as Doug were able to bring together a very large international consortium called the Breast Cancer Association Consortium that represents about 40 something studies mm -hmm. from all over the world. And at the moment, the study actually is close to 200,000 women already of which only 45,000 is Asian, right? So the reality is we keep pushing the boundaries of how many Asians we can include in these studies. So the, the study was possible because the collaboration framework has already been established by Professor Doug Easton in Cambridge and we were able to, uh, in a sense, collaborate with him, funded by uh, very significant international mm -hmm. awards. So we were very fortunate to win a Wellcome Trust Award. We were the first Malaysian scientists to win a Collaborative Science Award from the Wellcome Trust based in London and Yuki led a study that was also that was funded by the Newton grant under the Medical Research Council and that also provided funding to enable oh us to wonderful. move forward. Right? Okay. All right, we're gonna take another quick break but we'll come back and talk about women in sciences after this. Stay tuned to the features female. Welcome back to The Futures Female. I'm speaking to Dr. Tio Su Huang as well as um, Dr. Ho Wenqi and we're talking a little bit about uh, you know, the, the accomplishments uh, in science that, that both of you have uh, worked on with this study of, um, on the Asian population of uh, predicting risk of uh, breast cancer. I want to talk a little bit about your work as women in the sciences and whether you've seen a change in the time that you've been in the field 
of perhaps better opportunities uh, for advancement, uh, for funding, for tenure, for um, you know, all salary differentials, all of that, whether there's been um, a positive change in the time that you've been in the field? What, a, what would you say, Dr. <laughs> <laughs> Um, You've worked both abroad and locally as well, so maybe you can weigh in on I that. I think, yes. Um, I, I have joined the University of Nottingham for about seven years. Um, they, they have really put in a lot, a lot of effort trying to promote gender equality. Mm -hmm. So including, you know, organizing workshop, leadership workshop to get, uh, you know, like female academic to attend, trying to bring us up the career ladder ladders. So in the past few years, we really see an increase in the number of female professors in the university. Okay. So Personally, I think there is definitely some, some improvement, but there could be better? Uh, I mean, it, it always could be better. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what, about, what about you, Professor? The future is science. Mm. The reality is that's the message that we need to get out to all g girls out there. Mm -hmm. The future is science. So it doesn't matter what you do in terms of whether you're an engineer, you're a scientist, you're a doctor, or you're a math mathematician, you're an astrophysicist, it doesn't matter. But the future absolutely is science. Is there equal opportunity for women in STEM fields? I think in Malaysia at the university level, you know, um, you know, in, in a lot of the science departments, you actually see more women than you do men. Yeah. But the pr challenge is climbing that ladder is much harder. Okay. And part of it isn't so. It's partly due to the system, but also partly due to women themselves, right, and the family structure themselves. Okay. You know, so oftentimes when I'm asked, you know, what does it take for a woman to succeed in science? I actually say that actually quite often, you know, behind a successful man is a woman, just one, but every behind every successful woman is a family because the family actually needs to be incredibly supportive, not just from the husband's side, but someone needs to help with the children and with the education and it's with an the logistics. Army. And it's an army, <laughs> a yes, village, a army, family. Yeah. And, and I think it's that recognition that, um, that it's not just about the system in science that many organizations are trying to change, mm -hmm. you know, from the L'Oreal Women in Science Awards that put, put women out there, but also other awards, you know, be it uh, societal awards like Women's Weekly or Marie Claire and other magazines that try and highlight the role of women and put women scientists right. out there, right? Yeah. Not just successful entrepreneurs in the fashion world, yes. but also geek, geeks like us. Yes, Sometimes Make, making get geeks cool again. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> like I said, the future is the science. Future is yes. science uh, I know? do have to ask though that, you know, I, I hear you both that there are a lot of uh, scientists who are women who are working, trying to make a, a big difference in the field, but it's those leadership positions that we want women to feel, uh, to fill in the field of science. What would you say to uh, encourage uh, women to step up into leadership positions in, si in the sciences? Dr. Uh, <laughs> well, as, as I, well, as Sue mentioned, you really need an army behind you to support. Mm -hmm. And um, I think a program like this is important to, to you know, show young girls, show young women that, um, you know, how does a successful woman in all different fields. Okay, so representation, yeah, role yeah, models. Making the okay. awareness, mm -hmm. having the role model, you know, having the correct mentorship, these are all incredibly important. Mm. I realize in talking to a lot of men, especially my husband, that they approach, men and women approach failure very differently. Failure? Women are very scared of failure. Very, very scared of failure. And sometimes that fear of failure prohibits us from even taking that first step. Mm -hmm. We don't go for that application, we don't go for that grant because we, we ourselves think we're not good enough, right? So I think, um, I would say that so from my position, don't be scared, have thicker skin and <laughs> it's okay <laughs> to fail. And if you never know, you never go for it, you never will know, right? right? So it's just really important to just... Just go ahead and try. Go yeah. ahead and try. And there's okay. no loss in failing but that journey itself would help you grow. And if you don't go for it, you will never grow. You know, if, you're, if all your life was success, you've actually not grown. Yes, because you need to fail to learn from you it. Need I, to very fail. quickly, what, uh, in the time that we have left, I want to find out what's next. So this study has been such an accomplishment. It's been such a breakthrough. What is next? Are, we, are you building on the study? Are you working on something new? Absolutely. OK, yeah. what is so next? So now the next step is we've now worked out rare variants. We have a big study that's coming out in the, uh, sorry, we've in the polygenic risk was common variants. We now have an ongoing study on rare variants. Next step is on mammographic density. And what we now want to do is figure out how do we change the screening practices in Asian women. So this is now a research study. How do we translate this to actual practice 
so that it's a test that women can go to in every Ministry of Health hospital, for yeah. example. How do we get there? That's going to be the challenge in the next five years. Yeah, okay, wonderful. And getting that message out. Well, thank you both of you for being on the show and, and sharing this information with me and the audience. Thank you. Really appreciate your time. Thank you for thank having you. us. Yeah. Thank That's you. all the time we have on this episode of The Future's Female. I will be back with you same time next week. Thank you so much for watching and good night. Really? Can soy prevent breast cancer? Well, research shows that women who eat lots of soy are less likely to get breast cancer. But when does soy protect us? Should we start taking it as children? During pregnancy? Or after we reach menopause? Does it benefit Asian women more because it's already a part of our diet? How much soy should we take? Should we be eating tau every day? Help us find out! Cancer Research Malaysia is trying to save more lives in Asia through impactful cancer research. We need 270 women to help us find a way to prevent breast cancer. So far, 110 Malaysian women have joined the study. Some women have been drinking two glasses of soybean milk a day, and others have been taking soy supplements. But we need more women to help us. Call today if you are between 45 and 65 years old, no longer having menstrual periods, and otherwise healthy. Help us share this video to your friends and family. Together, we can help the future generation of women lower their risk of breast cancer. Don't wait! Call or share today!